Hi everyone and welcome to our last screencast on digestion. Today we're going to be talking about hormones and accessory organs. The first accessory organ we'll talk about is the liver. Now the liver is one of the largest organs in our body and the gallbladder that is tucked underneath the liver. We've already talked about the pancreas which sits beneath the stomach and upper intestines. So why do we call these accessory organs? Well, mainly because they're not part of the long tube that travels from our mouth to our anus. So we'll focus first on the liver. The liver, like I said, is the largest internal organ. It has a right lobe and a left lobe. It has over 500 jobs in the body. I'm only going to ask you to learn six of those. And all of the blood from the villi of the small intestines goes first to the liver and it travels through a special vein called the hepatic portal vein. You can see it here. And therefore, the nutrients absorbed from our food don't go to the heart first. They go to the liver first. And one of the reasons for that is because the liver acts as a gatekeeper and it helps to keep all of the different levels of nutrients in our blood constant. So here's a picture of a real liver. You can see it's a very large organ. So the first job that you'll need to know that the liver does is that it detoxifies any poisons or anything else harmful that were absorbed in your digestive tract and it turns alcohol into fatty acids. You can see those blobs of fat very clearly on this liver and over time that can cause scarring of the liver tissue and that gives rise to cirrhosis which may also give rise to liver cancer. The second job of the liver is to control the blood sugar levels at about 0.1 percent of your plasma and we know that when you have high blood sugar then insulin is released from the pancreas to turn the glucose into glycogen in the liver. This will cause your blood sugar to decrease and that will cause the pancreas to release glucagon. Now glucagon will tell the liver, you know what, you better turn some, some of that glycogen back into sugar and release it back into the blood. And that will raise the blood sugar level and this is just a long cycle. So homeostasis is maintained by lowering and increasing the blood sugar levels with the two hormones insulin and glucagon and the blood sugar will vary above and below that set point of 0.1 percent. The third job of the liver is to deaminate amino acids and what that means is that the liver can turn amino acids, can turn proteins into sugar, into glucose. That's called gluconeogenesis. Of course gluco represents sugar Genesis represents the beginning of, the birth of. So gluconeogenesis is the birth of sugar, turning amino acids into sugar. And what the liver does when it's making that is it has a byproduct of urea. So when the liver is turning amino acids into sugars, urea is also created. And so urea is released into the blood, it travels to the kidneys, and that is partly what makes up your urine. The fourth job of the liver is to destroy old red blood cells. Red blood cells can only live for about four months or about 120 days and the liver doesn't want to just destroy or give away that hemoglobin, spend a lot of energy making it in the first place, so we recycle it and we turn it into bile and it gets stored in the gallbladder. So the liver makes the bile and it gets stored in the gallbladder. Most of the hemoglobin gets reused by your bones to make new red blood cells. The stuff that's worn out is made into bile and the two parts that make bile are called bilirubin and biliverdin. Now if you have too much bilirubin in your blood you get something that's called jaundice. Lots of alcoholics have jaundice, the yellowing in the eyes, yellowing of your skin. And lots of babies are also born with jaundice and the fifth job of the liver is to make bile and of course is stored in the gallbladder and when the bile is released into the bloodstream it turns big fat blobs into little fat blobs. And this is called emulsification and the reason that we do this is because that helps the lipase, the enzyme lipase, turn those fats, those small fat blobs into fatty acids and glycerol. just makes it more efficient. So you've got a big fat blob coming in the small intestines bile will break that big fat blob into smaller fat blobs which are called micelles or fat droplets and then lipase will turn those fat droplets into fatty acids and glycerol by breaking the bonds between those triglycerides. Bile is really like soap. As it do it increases the surface area of the fat so that digestion happens more efficiently. The sixth job of the liver is to make proteins. Now it makes a lot of proteins. I know them are blood clotting proteins called fibrinogen 
and prothrombin. Another protein they make is called albumin. Now albumin helps the body to maintain osmotic pressure in the blood. If you look here you'll see prothrombin and fibrinogen are helping to make a blood clot. So what are the liver's jobs? The liver detoxifies poisons, it regulates blood sugar, it turns amino acids into sugars, it destroys old red blood cells and turns it into bile which then can emulsify fats and it makes proteins to help clot the blood and maintain osmosis. Next accessory organ that we'll talk about is the gallbladder. So here's the gallbladder and you'll see it is connected to the duodenum with what we call the common bile duct. As you see here it goes behind the stomach and inserts into the duodenum and the pancreas also inserts into the duodenum at the same place. So the gallbladder stores the bile that the liver makes and then when we eat fat the gallbladder will release bile through the common bile duct and into the duodenum. It will help to break those larger fat blobs into smaller micelles, fat droplets. And here you've got the gallbladder connecting with the bile duct and the pancreas also connects at the same spot in the duodenum. The gallbladder releases bile to digest fats and the pancreas releases the enzymes SALT and N to help digest all of the other types of food. Now sometimes your gallbladder will get gallstones. Now gallstones are very painful. They're just crystallized salts, crystallized bile salts, and they can get stuck in the ducts like this one here and that's extremely painful and of course also stops the bile and all of those pancreatic enzymes from being released into the duodenum to digest your food. It also inflames the pancreas so it's very painful. So the last topic we need to discuss when we're talking about digestion is how we control digestion and we do that with hormones. There are three hormones involved in the digestive process which you will need to learn about. So enzymes are really expensive to make, so we don't want to be making enzymes all the time in the guts if there's no food there. So we only make them when food is present. And how does the body know how to regulate it? Well, it does that through hormones. A hormone is just a chemical messenger that travels through the blood, so we control digestion with three hormones, gastrin, secretin, and CCK. We're talking about gastrin first. Gastrin is released by glands in the stomach when food enters the stomach, especially proteins. So when food enters the stomach, gastrin gets released. So what is the trigger, the release of gastrin? Food in the stomach. What does gastrin do? It tells the stomach to release its gastric juices. What are the gastric juices again? Hydrochloric acid, pepsinogen, and mucus. Gastrin stimulates the cells of the stomach to make gastric juices, and then the gastric juices are released. Pepsinogen in the gastric juices is activated by the hydrochloric acid and turned into pepsin and pepsin will start digesting your proteins. So it'll take those large polypeptides and will turn them into smaller polypeptides. The next digestive hormone that we'll talk about is secretin. Secretin is released by cells in the duodenum in the upper small intestine and they get released whenever the acid chyme comes through that pyloric sphincter from the stomach into the duodenum. So the trigger is that acid entering the small intestines and when the acid enters the small intestines the duodenum releases secretin and secretin will then travel through the blood to the pancreas and tell the pancreas to release all of its pancreatic juices. The S sodium bicarbonate a, amylase, L, lipase, T, trypsin, and N, nucleases. But the main point is so they can get that sodium bicarbonate into the small intestine to neutralize that acid chyme and change the pH from 2.5 to a pH of 8.5. So the secretin stimulates the pancreas to release its pancreatic juices. That releases sodium bicarbonate, which will neutralize the pH and turn it into 8.5. And if we didn't have this hormone secretin and we didn't have those pancreatic juices being released, then the pH would denature all the other enzymes that have to work in the intestines. CCK is our last hormone. CCK stands for cholecystokinin and it's also released by cells in the duodenum and it is released whenever fats and proteins enter the duodenum from the stomach. 
So what's the trigger? Fats and proteins coming into the duodenum. And what happens when CCK is released from the duodenum? Well, the CCK will travel through the blood to two places, the gallbladder to cause the release of bile, and it will travel to the pancreas to get more pancreatic juices released. So the gallbladder releases bile, and the bile will help to take those big fat blobs and emulsify them into smaller fat droplets. And then the pancreas releases its pancreatic juices, and the two enzymes we're interested in this case our lipase, which will help to digest the fat into fatty acids and glycerol, and the trypsin, which will take those smaller polypeptides from the stomach and digest them into di and tri peptides. There's also some evidence that CCK acts on the brain as a satiety signal, which basically just tells us that we're full and to stop eating. So that's it for digestion. Make sure you come to class with all of your questions about the whole process of digestion. See you next class.